All right. Good evening, everybody. Glad to have you guys here. Appreciate you guys sitting right there. We may end up having you move back one in a minute, but I uh, love having you guys up close. That's great. So I've already had a couple questions. People have asked me, if you guys listen right here, I don't want to have to repeat all these announcements. So uh, some, some people ask, where's Pastor Mays at tonight? Where's Mrs. Mays? So today, uh, Pastor Mays was driving a bus this morning at about, I don't know, probably early. And he came back home and laid down to take a nap. And while he was laying down, uh, something happened. We don't know what happened. But somehow, uh, he got wrapped up in the blankets. He fell off the bed about a three-foot drop and hit his head. Uh, when his Apple Watch, uh, which he's got the newest version of the Apple Watch, I guess, immediately sent a distress call out to Mrs. Mays. And so she was, I think she was driving a bus also. She came back home. He was unresponsive. He was not, she couldn't get him to talk or come to. So um, she called an ambulance, and the ambulance came and got him, took him to the hospital, took him to Annapolis. Uh, he's awake now, but he's lost a lot of his memory. Uh, but he has, he also has, I don't want to, I know he would tell you right online everything going on, but because of HIPAA and everything else, I don't want to do that. But I will tell you, he has a, um, some sort of infection that he's had in the past that with older people can affect their memory, is what Mrs. Mays was telling me. So she is praying and hoping and asking us to pray that it's just the infection causing the memory loss and not something in the brain, not something, or not related to the impact. Uh, she said he does have a, a bruise or a goose egg or something on his head, so um, she's not really sure what happened. Maybe in time we'll be able to find out. Maybe he can look at his Apple Watch and they can look at his heart and everything else. I don't know. But that's where we're at at the moment. So he's got quite a bit of memory loss, really, uh, from what I understand, was thinking he's in 2021 or something like that. Uh, so lost a couple years of memory. Uh, he couldn't remember driving the bus or anything else. So ne needless to say, the hospital is keeping him overnight tonight. Uh, they're going to run a CAT scan. And then if that doesn't show anything, they're going to run an MRI and then further testing. So uh, just be in prayer for him. Be in prayer for Mrs. Mays. I called her a little bit later, and she, her voice was you know, kind of shaky and broken there so naturally. So... Uh, just keep them in your prayers. Here's what we're going to plan to do. I told Mrs. Mays, I said, just stay at the hospital. Don't come to church. You don't need to be here. And um, I think we're just going to kind of take command here and say, I'll be preaching Sunday school and Sunday morning this Sunday. And Brother Andre Buck is going to be preaching Sunday night for us. So we'll cover the Sunday services. Even if pastor's out of the hospital, um, uh, he, he's not going to be in any shape to put together those sermons, so we'll plan on covering that. What does that mean for Sunday morning bus run? I don't know yet, um, but we may be able to work it out. We'll see who's available. We're not putting anything in stone yet. Um, if Mrs. Mays can drive, maybe she can drive. If the with the numbers that we've been having, I think we I don't think we've had uh, more than 15. I can probably run the van out there. Um, it's a little challenging sometimes with getting everything ready, but we'll tr do our best to come out and get you guys. But what I would need you to do, and I'm not going to announce it online, but uh, you could text me, and I can, if you get with me, I can give you my phone number before you guys leave tonight, okay? I don't think, Brother Eddie, I think he has to work every Sunday pretty much, so he wouldn't be available to drive the bus. So, okay, everybody feel good about that? Okay, so that's where we're at. So here's what we'll do tonight. Brother Andre and Miss Becky are going to take all of the kids, everybody that's in sixth grade and below, uh, and they'll teach you guys tonight in the back, okay? And then teenagers, uh, Ezekiel, you look afraid. Be very afraid. All right, so um, the teenagers, you'll stay out here with me. I know I mentioned last Wednesday we'd do hot dogs. We're going to cut that tonight. Sorry, guys. Hope you didn't come super hungry. But... Um, We'll, but I'll make that up to you. We'll do hot dogs next Wednesday, assuming everything's back to normal. Kind of one of those situations where it's out of my hands. Um, I know the Bible says, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So uh, I definitely want to make it up to you. We'll do that another night. We'll probably break it down um, and do like one game with the teenagers tonight or a couple rounds of the same game. Same thing we've been playing just to kind of uh, break the ice and then we'll preach tonight. Okay. All right, well, let's stand together, and we're going to sing a song, Footsteps of Jesus. It's up here on the board and uh, on the screen. I was waiting for the piano to start, and I realized there's not a pianist to play tonight. So 
Uh, we're going to sing this a cappella. You ready? Here we go on that first verse. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountains, seeking his sheep. Or along by Siloam's fountains, helping the weak. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. If they lead through the temple holy, preaching the word, or in homes of the poor and lowly, serving the Lord. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Then at last when on high he sees us, our journey done. We will rest where the steps of Jesus and at his throne. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Amen. That was good singing. Next time I'm going to get you girls like the backup singers right here with me because you sound so good. All right. Well, thank you guys for singing along. I hope you think about that. It does, as Pastor says, it does prepare your heart for preaching, but it also, I think, gets you, just gets you, your mind off of everything else that's been going on, kind of a reset. Uh, sometimes you need something to break the day and what we're about to do. And I think music kind of helps with that. So, alrighty, well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to dismiss you guys to your class uh, with Brother Andre and Miss Becky, and then we'll get started in here, okay? Father, thank you for this night. Thank you that we can be here. Lord, I thank you for people who can just help out on the last minute notice. Thank you for Brother Eddie running the bus, uh, probably on a, with a time crunch, but thank you that he did that, and he's filling up the bus even now and just taking care of those things. Lord, I thank you for Brother Andre uh, and Miss Becky stepping up to teach really kind of last minute and uh, taking that burden on. And then, Lord, I know that over the next days there will be different people taking on different burdens, and sometimes it's just the, the um, opportunity of prayer. And so, Lord, I pray you'd be with each person that's stepping up to help out, uh, bearing one another's burdens. And, Lord, I thank you for every person who came out tonight, even the spirit that everybody seems to have tonight. And I do pray for Pastor that you'd just be with him. And I ask, Lord, um, according to your will, that you would heal him and, Lord, help him. Uh, I, pr I pray that what Mrs. Mays was requesting would happen, that this, whatever this memory loss is, is not based on his brain, not any kind of stroke or mini stroke or anything like that, but it might be something as simple as an infection that antibiotics can take care of. So, Lord, I pray you'd just give them uh, peace of mind tonight. And uh, I pray that you'd be with them. Uh, let this message and this service bless those that hear. And Lord, maybe somebody one day or tonight even watching might be saved or might hear some things that challenges them to walk closer to you. And I pray this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Thank you. Young people, you are dismissed with Miss Becky and Brother Andre. Uh, teenagers will stay in here. Why don't you guys, yeah, go back a, a seat or two. And you can spread over both sides. I kind of like the balance on the sides here and preach better that way, I think. So, all right. Good to have you guys here today and tonight. Glad for that. Got a good number of teens. I'll stay in the center. Yep. Can you broaden it so I can move a little bit both ways? Okay. Awesome. I appreciate that. We need to get one of those things I mentioned it before that Apple has. You put it around your neck and the camera follows you wherever you go. That thing would be awesome for in here. All right. Great. Thank you, Brother Andre. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't think so. When it comes time for prayer, I'll have my dad come up here and he can pray. And I think we can take care of it. Are all the mics on? Perfect. Okay. No problem. I'm going to mute it and I'm going to move it here so I don't forget. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I will say this, I don't usually address the internet, but I'm going to do it right now, and then I'm going to tune into you guys only. But if you're watching online, we are still working on our sound booth, and uh, anything can happen at any time. So if you're relying on the online service, uh, just be aware, things can go down in the next couple days. Right now we have no internet, we're running off a hot spot. So if that goes down or that's not available, you're going to be out of luck at the time of service. So just want to put that out there. If you're able to be here in body, come and be here in body, okay? Fair warning. So, all right, glad you guys are here tonight. Looking forward to a good night. It'll be a little different. It's not youth night in our youth room, but we're still going to, everything is catered to you guys, and we're going to just bring some of our adults down back to their youthful years. And so, um, <laughs> and Brother Eddie should be back on his way also. He's filling up the bus. He said it was uh, after this run, it was it needed fuel before trying to take everybody home. So he he thought that was a good priority to go get on. So I said, go for it, Brother Eddie. Um, let's see. I don't think I have anything new to announce to you guys. I will be pro preaching uh, the second message out of Joseph or on Joseph tonight. I told you guys that last week, and several of you seemed excited to go further with it. So we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, with the adults, Pastor has a prayer time at the end. So I'm going to try to be very timely tonight so that we can do that and still get everybody out on time. It's 712 now, so we'll take a few minutes and do a couple games, and then we'll get into preaching. Sound good? All right. So um, I don't want to burn out Ultimate Ninja, but it is a favorite, and it is a classic, and I don't know that the adults have seen it. So why don't we, and I, do ha I did get the light up volleyball. It's here. Uh, we have it now. It's pretty cool, too. But it's cold outside tonight, and uh, I'm still chilled to the bone. So I think we'll stay inside, and we'll do some a couple rounds of Ultimate Ninja. Uh, who ended up being like the most often victor last week? I mean, of course, I was sitting out making hot chocolate for you guys. So, you know, I, I gave you a little advantage there. Brody ended up being the, the Grandmaster. You too? Okay. So we'll find out tonight who's going to be the Ultimate Ninja. Ninja. Now here's the cool part. In here we have the pews, so when we play, we stand on the back of the pews and we balance. <laughs> so, just joking. All right. So, uh, why don't we get all of our teens to come up? with better if everybody plays. So, do you know how to play Ultimate Ninja? Okay, come on up. You know how to play. You've been here. All right, come on up. We're gonna play. All right, I'm gonna announce it right now. I won't play this first round. We'll let you guys show off a little bit here, but I'm going to just kind of say, I think I'm out of camera view, but that's okay. So the way this game works for our adults that are watching, it's a hand slapping game, not face slapping, Destiny, don't be slapping faces. Um, no, I'm joking, but it's a hand slapping game. They know how to play now. They're going to all be in this circle pretty tight together. And Michael, you can't have your hands in your pockets. That doesn't work. Um, and so you got to have your hands out. They're going to bow. They're going to get into some kind of karate stance. Then they can't move their feet. They have to stay planted. But they can strike at anybody they want to when it's their turn. If they get any part of their hand, then not the wrist or the forearm, but any part of the hand itself, that person is out. They can only move if it's their turn and they're striking or if they are dodging a strike. They can also strike at two people at once. And so once they get warmed up, the game gets going pretty quick. And I've never seen anybody go as fast, though, as Melanie Boyd and myself did 20 years ago, 10 years ago. But anyways, we'll just leave that one in the books. All right, are you guys ready? All right. Who wants to start? Oh, great. oh all right, Nehemiah's going to start. Which way are you going to go, Nehemiah? 
going that way. So that means, DeMichael, you're next. We'll come on around this way, okay? All right, everybody bow. What's up? Get in your cry positions. All right, go. Ooh, did he get you, Anderson? Yeah. Oh, man. We're going to blame that on the uh, tournament this weekend. Oh, she took you out, man. You must have worked too hard today. You're out. All right, scoot in, tighten your circle. All right. We're trying to toughen this generation up. That's really what this is about. Speed. Oh, double whammy. Brian is going for it tonight. Oh, oh. I'm yelling into the microphone. Anybody watching online is like, quick, hit the mute button. So who won? Nehemiah. Nehemiah, winner. All right, come back in. All right, we'll get you guys warmed up. All right, I'll play two. All right, I'm going to turn my mic off for a second.
It's better if you go faster. Oh, you're in bad shape. You're out. All right, foot to foot. Lightning round, as fast as you can go. Go. Oh, that was quick, Brian. Yeah. Good shot. All right. Okay, we'll take a break for now, and then uh, we'll come back and play again in a little bit. So if we have time, if we have time. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I love that game. What's funny is we've been playing that for 15 years in the youth group, and it hasn't gotten old. We just took about a five-year break. So, yeah, probably more than that, probably 10. Man, how long have you been in the youth group now? Before COVID? Yeah, that was three years ago. I don't know, man. I'm getting old. All right. Youth group's rolling on. All right. Okay. Well, I'm glad you guys are here tonight. And uh, spilling water on myself. Quick drying shirt. Okay. So we have fun in youth group. And glad you guys are here. And uh, looking forward to what, what comes over the next weeks and months. So you guys pray for Brody. He's got some uh, stuff coming up. Is that confirmed? The things you're telling me on Wednesday nights? Is that going to definitely happen? Uh, I don't really know yet. We haven't had much information on it. So my teacher was telling me about it. Gotcha. Okay, so just something for his future. Uh, he can tell you about it if he wants to, but on Wednesday nights possibly. But it, I wouldn't mind praying that it would happen on a different night so he can keep coming to youth group because I really like having Brody in here as I do all you guys. I, I hate to lose anybody at this point, and we've got a good youth group. I'm really happy that all you guys are here. So, all right, well, last Wednesday night I began preaching <clears throat> a series with you guys on the life of Joseph. And the first sermon really consisted uh, or considered Joseph's character as compared to his brother. So remember, we read chapter 37 of Genesis, and we read about Jacob, and we read about his son Joseph, and we read about all the brothers. And you remember the story that in the story, and a true story is an account, so, but I call it a story because it's a narrative. And so in that account, the Bible tells us that Joseph was the youngest son at that point, People can argue about whether Benjamin was born or not. We've had that discussion many times. Who knows? But at that moment, Joseph is the primary character that's looked at. He's 17 years old, fits right in with you guys. I don't think we have any 17-year-olds, but we do have 16-year-olds. And we've got 15-year-olds. And so we've got people around that age range that Joseph was, really would identify with your age range. He's got older brothers, and those brothers are more like my age, like 32, 33, and 40. Uh, and so he's got those older brothers. And we learned throughout that message and that, that chapter that the brothers really, they were all knuckleheads. They did not have any character. They were a disgrace to their father. They were a disgrace towards God. They went out. They were supposed to do work for dad. They were in the family business of shepherding. And they would take the sheep out. And when they'd get far enough away where dad couldn't see them, as grown men, then they would go and they'd play all the time. They didn't do the work they were supposed to do. They were running off. The Bible doesn't tell us everything that was going on, but we get the idea they were getting into some, maybe even some legal troubles. And so dad sends Joseph, the favorite, out to spy on the brothers to check out what's going on because he knows that he can trust his son, Joseph. Joseph had great character. That's what we preached about last Wednesday was the character of Joseph. And we talked about Joseph um, really taking on the character of Joseph for ourselves, and we got real applicable to it, and we talked about things like, um, even in the youth room, I said that I really appreciate when uh, somebody, a teenager especially, notices that something's on the floor, there's trash on the floor, there's, there's crumbs on the floor, and at 15, 16 years old, without me saying anything, they go and they find the broom and they sweep it up. That's character, okay? This is going to drive me nuts popping like that, but sorry about that. I guess it's our sound system. And so that was just one, one thing we talked about. We talked about the character of honoring your parents and the fact that his brothers did not, but he did. And we, I didn't bring it out really, but dad probably shouldn't have played favorites with him. And we know he did. He gave him the coat of many colors. And, you know, he should have had something for the other brothers too. It doesn't always, equality or equal stuff does not always mean the same stuff. He could have done something different for the brothers and it would have been a little wiser on dad's part. He just wasn't being real wise at that moment. But he loved his youngest son, Joseph, who was the son of his old age. Two thoughts on that. That phrase, I've heard it said, I can't confirm this, that I've heard it said, the son of his old age means that he was a wise guy. I mean, he's a wise young man. At 17 years old, his wisdom surpassed his age. Okay, he was like a brother Eddie Gottschalk when he's 17 years old, you know, and so he's just one of those old time guys with wisdom. 
That's one thought. The other thought is literal, and it could be both. But literal, he's the baby of the family, 17 years old. The other guys are 40. And so I think I pointed out, if not, I told my daughters this later on. I said, I hope you girls never feel like Everett is our favorite or anything like that because we ooh and ah and goo over him. I said, that is absolutely not the case because we ooh and ah and gooed over each of our daughters when they were little. And Everett's a, he's not a baby, he's a big boy now. But he's, a, he's our baby big boy, so he oohs and ahs and goos and all that stuff. But the girls get stuff that he doesn't get. So it's just, it's just a different time of life. But dad, at that point, oohed and odd over Joseph. But Joseph really did have great character. His brothers severely lacked it. And the sermon last week finished with the conclusion that Joseph's behavior, his attitude, his beliefs, his reputation, even what God did in his life, were all something that we should strive to have in our own lives as it would be pleasing to God, it would be a good testimony to man. If you name Jesus as your Savior, if you know that you've been born again, you've put your faith in Jesus, called on him to save you because you knew you were a sinner, then you're a Christian, and we ought to live in such a way that we please God and other people look at us and they go, man, I really do want what they've got. And so that's how Joseph was. And we could get into other stuff too. When we say it that way, it's, it's not always... Uh, this corny idea, but as you'll see in, in the chapter tonight, Joseph really did have some stuff about him that you'd be wise to want to have in your life. Um, I don't want to make the Bible about us because it's not about us. It's about God. It's about Jesus who died for us, and we're the benefactors. We get things because of how good he was to us, but I will tell you that you can't help but see what God did in Joseph's life, and you'd be a fool to not want that, right? I mean, King Solomon, just to throw this out here and then we'll move on, King Solomon, when God appeared to him and said at 21 years old, tell me what you want, paraphrase. He said, tell me what I shall give thee. And he, and he basically says, he says, God, I'm like a baby. I don't know how to rule this kingdom. I don't know how to go out and come in. The only thing I need, God, the only thing is wisdom. And God says to him, I know your heart, and I know all the things you could have asked for. And I know you could have asked for money, and you could have asked for fame, and you could have asked for popularity and the lives of your enemies, and you could have asked for everything this life offered, and yet you asked for wisdom. And God says, that pleases me. He says, I'm going to give you the wisdom you asked for, but I'm going to give you all the things you didn't ask for that I know you really would like to have. I can't, I'd be lying if I ever said, I really wish God would approach me and ask me, what do I want? And I would say, God, I want wisdom. <laughs> okay, you didn't get that. All right, but that would be a little bit manipulative, wouldn't it? And so, but the reality is, I want those things too. I'd like to have money and wealth and wisdom and fame and all of that. But when Solomon asked for it, he wasn't being manipulative. He had the right heart. And so, but he got all of that stuff along with it. But it's not about that stuff, and it's not about Solomon. It's about God. And so anyways, coming back to where we're at tonight, we also determined this. This was the ending of our message feels a little different being in here than in the uh, youth room, doesn't it? Yeah, that's all right. Just try to listen because you're going to get the story of Joseph a little further. We also determine that the real character of a person, good or bad, whether you have good character, bad character, it's all determined by your heart. That was kind of the final statement that we made last Wednesday. The heart determines the character. Your actions, your beliefs, everything, it all comes from the heart. That's why Scripture declares this truth in Proverbs 4.23, which says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, and here's why. For out of it are the issues of life. And that word issues is like a fountain. Everything that comes out of your life comes from the heart. It's all about the heart. So Joseph's character really came down to his heart. And so tonight, we're going to continue following Joseph's journey a little bit with a closer look at his heart. So we looked at his character last week in chapter 37. Chapter 38 has nothing to do with Joseph. It actually deals with one of his brothers who goes off and is a true knucklehead and gets into all kinds of trouble. So we're skipping chapter 38, and then we're going on to chapter 39. And here's what we find. If we look at his heart, that's the engine of life that determines everything about a person. What do, I, I said, uh, I think I made a big deal about this last Wednesday night, that the reason that I fell in love with Grace, I think she's absolutely beautiful, I think she's gorgeous, everything about her is exactly what I want, but the reason that I really fell in love with her was her heart, it was her character. You guys remember me talking about that? Man, you can marry some pretty girls, guys, and girls, you can marry some handsome guys, 
But outward beauty doesn't do a whole lot. There's a saying that there's a lot of people that are, and I don't, I, you have to understand what I'm saying. A lot of people that are fun to hang out with, a lot of people that are fun to party with, a lot of people that are fun, but they don't make good wives, they don't make good husbands, they don't make good moms, and they don't make good dads. And there's a lot that this world can offer you that five, six, seven years down the road turns out to be real trash. And so you would be far better to go after somebody that you're attracted to, but it's not just the outward appearance, it's the whole package, and especially the heart. People can lose weight pretty quickly. People's faces can clear up pretty quickly. Hair can change over time. Everything about us, and we all change and degrade in time. But that heart, that's what doesn't change. It can actually grow, while the outside grows older and heavier and saggier, the heart can grow brighter and brighter and brighter. And then you just fall in love with that person more and more all the time. So the character is what we want to look at. It's the engine of life that determines everything about a person. So we're going to examine his heart, we're going to, and hopefully we're going to adjust our own hearts tonight. So my idea is that if you're saved, I want you to hear what we have to say, what the Bible has to say about Joseph, what I'm going to try to bring out tonight, and then I'm hoping that you're going to go, man, I'm going to, I'm going to try and do some of that. Last Wednesday, I challenged you at the end of the night. I said, I want you to pick one thing. Just one thing, you might remember me saying that at the end of the night, that you know, for, based on preaching that you've heard or a Bible that you've read or anything that you've heard, one thing you know God doesn't want in your life or one thing that God does want in your life, and try to subtract or add that one thing. Just start there. If your language is foul and filthy and you know, based on scriptures, that, that God doesn't want you to be that way, or if you're, if you're always telling lies but you know you've been saved, that's the key. You've got to be saved, otherwise... It doesn't do any good to, to clean all that up. It doesn't get you anywhere, okay? But if you know you're saved and, and you're always tempted to tell lies or you're telling things all the time that aren't true, then stop that. Cut it off. Pick one thing. And then after you work on that for a while, pick one more thing and start working on that. And it's really a re, uh, it's recreating new habits in your life with the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, so tonight we're going to look at his heart. Let's look at Genesis chapter 39, and we're, just, we're going to read 23 verses here, about the same as we read the other night. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. This is after he was sold. Remember, pulled up out of that pit, sold to those Midianite merchantmen. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, bought him sorry, of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So he's now officially sold into slavery. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. Talking about the master there. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Did you catch that? It didn't just bless Joseph, he's blessing the Egyptian's house that Joseph is living in. And the, by the way, if you guys live for Jesus, it'll be a blessing in your parents' house. It'll be a blessing in your school. You may not always be aware of how it's a blessing, but it will affect people around you. It will affect things around you in your life. Okay. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Verse 6. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had <clears throat> save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. So we'll stop there for just a second. So... Potiphar buys Joseph. He's been sold from his brothers. They traveled from Israel where they were down to Egypt. He's been taken captive. He was sold at the slavery market. He's now working in Potiphar's house. Potiphar is the, the captain of the guard. He's the general of, of the pharaoh of Egypt's army. And so he's really the, the top dog. He's the wealthiest guy, probably is the number two in the land. And Joseph is sold as a slave into that guy's house. He's there, and immediately Joseph is beginning to be blessed by the Lord, and Potiphar recognizes it. And so Potiphar goes, man, everything you touch seems to be blessed. He goes, I'm going to put you in charge, and I know I can trust you. That, that's 
by the way, that's, that's pretty, at 17 years old, and a rich man has you working in his house, you work on yachts, you think those people are rich? A little bit. <laughs> Do you ever have anybody just let you come on the yacht and walk around and they don't watch and they don't observe or they're just letting you do your thing? Um, me, yeah, I'm not like any ordinary person. Yeah, that's exactly where he's at. <laughs> not just anybody gets to walk around Potiphar's house. The man with the weapons, the man in charge of protecting Egypt, and yet Joseph does. And so Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's servant, Potiphar, hires him or really takes him in. He doesn't hire him, puts him in charge of everything. And the Bible says Potiphar was so entrusting of Joseph at 17 years old that Potiphar didn't even know what he had, didn't even take inventory of the things in his house. Got a PlayStation 5, got a couple of them, got all these games. He doesn't know what he's got. He just knows he's got stuff. And it's Joseph's job to organize everything and put it all away and clean it up. Of course, he didn't have PlayStation 5 back then. And so, but whatever it is, the Maserati camel, he goes and he parks the camel, right? He gets to do whatever it is that he needs to do without his boss looking over his shoulder, micromanaging him, because the boss trusts him. That's how much it is. I mean, it's, it's pretty awesome there. And so then the Bible goes on in verse 7. Oh, in, in verse 6, it says one more thing. This is interesting. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. That has nothing to do with his character. It has everything to do with how much he lifts. That's what it's all about. A goodly person in the Bible is not a godly person. A goodly person is somebody that looks good. That's literally what it means. And then it says, and well-favored. Well-favored literally means his body was attractive. So Joseph is a good-looking, muscular, 17-year-old guy. He's probably pretty tan, living in Egypt at that time. And it came to pass after these things. Here's why God put it in there so we would know that. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. So this girl, this woman, the wife of Potiphar, she's not into ugly dudes. Maybe her husband was ugly, I don't know, but she looks at Joseph and she goes, that dude's goodly. He's well favored. He's a hottie, hottie, hot, hot. That's what she's saying. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. I mean, sleep with me. Be with me sexually. And he, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There's none greater in this house than I. <laughs> Nobody can do what I do in this house. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. If I want a steak out of the fridge, I get a steak. If I want a milkshake in the milkshake machine, I get it. He's got his very own freeze machine over there. I have whatever I want. He says, but you've been held back from me because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, so every day now, She's coming to him, tantalizing him, teasing him, flirting with him, appealing to him, that he hearken not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. So she came to him and grabbed him by his shirt. And she says, come on, nobody's around. It's just me and you in the house. We're all alone. Come on, nobody will ever know. That's what, I mean, you got to understand, nobody walks up to somebody and says, lie with me, and leaves it at that. There's a whole lot. The Bible gives us the, what we need to know. It doesn't tell us every detail of what happened. But you can fill in the blanks. This woman wants him. She's going to do everything she can to flirt with him and to get his attention. And she says, lie with me. And here's what he, happens. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So he slips out of the, whatever he's wearing and he runs out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. She cried rape. Attempted rape. That's what she's saying. She said, this shirt? He was taking off his clothes, and he was going to try and abuse me or rape me or be with me. And I got his shirt, and I screamed, and he ran out, and I've still got This is proof he was trying to rape me. And the Bible gives us here... 
the full story. We know what happened. Verse 16. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. His Lord would be Potiphar, the master of Joseph. So she's going to tell her husband now that Joseph tried to rape her. And she said, and she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him. And put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. So now, t- time out for a moment. So I'm, I'm explaining all this. I don't, wouldn't normally do all this with the adults. But I want you guys to really know what's going on in the story. You may not be very familiar with it. So he's been sold into slavery. He's been doing great. There's not been anything against his character. It shows the boneheadedness of Potiphar. Potiphar immediately, now, I mean, I understand trusting your wife and believing, taking her word at I get that. But Joseph has had all of these things in place, doing everything right, and all of a sudden, he's accused of rape, and immediately Potiphar grabs him and throws him into prison. Doesn't even give him a chance to explain, doesn't investigate anymore, throws him in prison. And now he's in prison. It's the deepest, darkest dungeon. This is where Pharaoh's prisoners go. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand. Well, that sounds familiar. Because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Brother Eddie, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to ask you to turn the heat off because I think it's getting a little toasty up in here. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for your word. I pray that now you'd help me to to bring it to life for everybody, to help them understand and make good application. And I pray that we'd be wise with everything tonight. Again, I pray for Pastor and ask that you'd be with him and Mrs. Mays and their family. I pray that you'd be with our church tonight and this weekend. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've read our passage tonight, and I'm going to give you just a couple things to understand. Tonight, we we have to ask the question, how is it that Joseph had all of these positive things said about him? How is it that God seemed to be with him? Why was all of that happening? Well, I want to tell you, first of all, that Joseph had the heart of God. When you read the passage, you cannot help but see that Joseph had the heart of God. Seven times, I don't think that's a coincidence, seven is the number of perfection. Seven times in this chapter, God's word records God's thoughts and actions towards Joseph. In verse number two, it says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. The Bible says in verse three, And his master saw the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. In verse 4, it says, And Joseph found grace in his sight, talking about Potiphar's sight. And you go, well, where does that say anything about God? Well, in Proverbs 16, 7, the Bible says that when a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so you would think that a man who is going to be a slave owner is not going to be your friend, is not going to be at peace with you, but is going to be very demanding, very commanding, very rough with you. And yet that's not at all what it is. The Bible says that Joseph found grace in his sight. It means he dealt with him gently. It means that he trusted him. He became like a friend to him. He took care of him. Even later on, when Joseph speaks to his uh, master's wife, he says to her, your husband hasn't kept anything back from me. That's why I said, if I want a steak out of the fridge, we understand they didn't have fridges, they probably weren't eating steak. But if I want a steak out of the fridge, I can go get it. And he doesn't care because Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. He lets me eat of anything that I want to eat of. He lets me live off of what he has here. He's trusting me, and I don't abuse that. That's what he was saying. That's what that conversation was about. Verse number uh, 5. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in the house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Verse 21 says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And verse 22, 
And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners. So he did what Potiphar did. Again, Proverbs 16, 7. And finally, verse 23. I know I'm moving quickly through this part. In verse 23, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Guys, Joseph had God's heart. Everywhere Joseph went, he prospered. Everything he did, we find that he was highly favored by God and he had his blessings. Joseph was said to have God with him. Wherever he went, God was there. Whatever he touched, God touched. It's the Midas touch. You guys know who King Midas is? And that, man, what a curse that would be. Go to pick up an apple, rock solid gold. Can't eat it. Go to kiss your wife, bing, you got a golden statue. I mean, it's a curse to be able to turn anything into gold, but not for Joseph. His hand was prosperous. Everything he did turned out well. Think about that. You ever feel like you're accident prone or have a day or two where everything goes wrong? You can't ever seem to get things right? Probably not. But some people do. And he was, what we find is that everything he did turned out well. He went to work as a slave and he immediately rose to the top. He went into the prison later on. He's thrown into prison. And instead of being a prisoner in shackles, he's made in charge of everybody. And the actual guy in charge sits back and watches TV in The Lazy Boy while he lets Joseph handle everything because he knows it's going to turn out right. And so we find out he was highly skilled and thoughtful. Why would Potiphar let him be in charge of everything in the house, and why would it all prosper? Because everything he did, he was able to figure out. He was mentally sharp. Even his appearance commanded the respect, the admiration, the attraction of others around him. Potiphar's wife's like, dude, he looks good. And she's interested in him. She chases him down. Everybody else that's watching goes, man, I want to be with Joseph. I want want him to work for me. He makes everything go well. And Joseph even had a peace and a mutual respect with those who would otherwise be his enemies. Potiphar as his master, the keeper of the prison. So here's what the Bible tells us in Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. When you do what, what God wants you to do, it makes even... Your enemies to be at peace with you. Listen, we could focus on man in this verse, but there's another important concept, and that's this, that God was pleased with a man. That means that God can be pleased with you. God can, God can be happy with the way that your heart is towards him. God can be happy with your life. And when a man pleases God, God sees to it that the life of that man is positively affected. In other words, God's so good... That he not only wants to save us sinners, by the way, if you're not saved tonight, he wants to save you. He's seeking you. He's sent his son to die for you over 2,000 years ago to pay the price for your sin. He, God already reached out and did the work, and he's waiting for you to take his hand. But God's so good that he not only wants to save us sinners, but he actually wants to give his heart to us as well. Think about that for a moment. My son, Everett, On Tuesday nights are a special time for us because uh, mom and the girls are out and it's just me and Everett at home. And there's been one or two times where I needed to do some other things and so I would ask Grace to take him with her or, or whatever the case might be and he's not there with me. And then I feel bad the next day about it. But the nights that he's home with me is buddy buddy time. I mean I'm dad, you know, I, I'm, I discipline and everything else, but it's the guy's night that time. And I'm like, Everett, what do you want to do tonight? He goes, well, Dad. Or he'll say, well, Daddy, I think we should go to Christopher's and get some ice cream. Or he'll say, well, I think we should go to Royal Farms, and maybe you can get me one of those SpongeBob or Spider-Man popsicles. So we'll go there, and we'll get that ice cream, or we'll get that popsicle, and then I'll say to him, well, is that all you want to do? He goes, oh, no, no, let's go home and watch Cars movie. So he wants to watch Cars. And every night, it's always Cars. Finally, last night... I was like, Everett, why don't we watch Toy Story instead? He's like, okay, we can watch Toy Story. And we lay on the couch. He's getting a little big now, so the couch is getting smaller and smaller. But we lay on the couch, and he'll snuggle up next to me, and he, I'll put my arm up, and he finds like a nook right there, puts his head in it. He snuggled up to me, and we're just having buddy time. And we watch the movie, and we eat our ice cream. Last night, I, was, uh, I didn't want to spend the money on the ice cream. So I ended up making, I said, well, why don't I make us a peanut butter and jelly smoothie? And that sounds kind of gross, but it's not. Take frozen blueberries, throw some peanut butter or almond butter in it, blend it up with some milk, add a little sweetener to it. Oh, that's good stuff. I feel like peanut butter and jelly. Well, Everett loves peanut butter and jelly. He's like, Daddy, I don't think I like that very much. I said, just give it a taste. 
He's like, okay, I'll taste, I'll taste a little bit. And for, in fact, he wasn't, he didn't want it at first. And then I, so I put it in the blender, and he saw it all blended up. And I pour, I go, oh man, that's good. He goes, maybe I'll have a little bit, Daddy, just a little bit, in case I don't like it. Okay, but he tastes it, and I add a little extra sweetener. And he's like, wow. I want more of that. Just fill my cup up. So I filled it up for him, and he's chugging down this smoothie. We're watching Toy Story. It's a great night. God wants to have that same relationship with you. The Bible tells us that God wants us to actually cry out to him, Abba, Father. You've heard pastors say Abba is like saying Papa. I've heard other uh, preachers say it's like saying Daddy. Whatever the word is, it has to do with that special term between a kid and their dad. It's that sweet term. And that's what God wants to have with us. It's not that he he saves us so we can just be his robotic servants, but it's that he really wants to have a relationship with us and know us. And and, and I can't even make you understand what I'm talking about. You have to experience it. Um, This morning, there were some things heavy on my heart I was thinking about early. Woke up, got up at five, and... uh, I, the song popped into my head right away, Sweet Hour of Prayer, and we sang it. We've been singing it on Sunday nights. It popped into my head, so I went and made my coffee. Went in, I pray all the time in the car, but it's not the same. And I, I was up. I, got, I went to bed at 9 last night. had a full night's sleep. felt so good. So I was able to get up at 5, no problem, wide awake, walked into my living room. I put a couple pillows on the floor because hardwood floors are hard on the knees and toes, and I knelt down at my couch and I prayed. And I, I just... Told Lord, I was like, I've got 10 minutes, Lord, but I want to talk to you. And just took that 10 minutes, and it's silent, and it's dark. And I can't explain the difference, but when you get back up and you're like, let's get it. I'm telling you, it's just something you have to experience. And if your faith is real and, and you try that, sometimes it doesn't mean you have to do what I do. It's just, I'm just telling you, that's, that's my relationship with the Lord. But it, it makes a difference. And so there's one verse here in the um, past. Actually, let me, let me back up before I say that. In other words, God's so good that he doesn't just want to save us. He wants us to have his heart as well. And the Apostle Luke wrote this, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He wrote that to us, but the inverse is also true. What your heart is set on is your treasure. So in God's goodness, we can actually experience the heart of God when he looks at us as his treasure. All of a sudden, God's looking at us, and he's going, I sent my son to die for you. You're my treasure. You're my prize. You're what I want. Anybody that, I mean, teenagers all the time, as much as I preach against it, I know they're still doing it. And so when you're interested in a boy or a girl, you want to date somebody at 9 years old, 13 years old, 15 years old. I'm joking, of course. But when you want to, what is it that your heart wants? Really what it's craving is for somebody to love you. It's for somebody to to desire you. It's somebody to want you. Listen, God desires you. God wants you. How do you know that? He sent Jesus to die for you. And because of that, you can have that. And there's no strings attached when you're in a relationship with God. A lot of times you date a 15-year-old boy, girls, and there's strings attached. And you date a girl and there's strings attached. Buy me this. Guys might say, give me that. Do this with me. With God, there's no strings attached. And in the scheme of our redemption, God's love for us and that desire, it's not based on what we do, by the way. It's not based on how trustworthy you are. It's not based on your character. It's not, it's not based on any of that. God does that because that's his character. But when you go beyond salvation, after you've been saved, one has to wonder, what's the difference between Joseph and his brothers? Why did God like seem to give Joseph his heart and the brothers didn't have it? Why did God give Joseph his heart but the Egyptians didn't have it? If God's eye is on the human race and God wants everybody to be saved, Egyptians and Jews and blacks and whites and and, uh, Chinese and everybody, if that's the case, why is it that Joseph seemed to have God's heart in such an intense way? I think it really comes down to one thing. God had the heart of Joseph. Now, I've been saying Joseph had the heart of God, but now God had the heart of Joseph. That's your part. See, you don't have to do anything to have the heart of God. But the reason that God was so intensely favoring him and giving him these blessings and and touching his life is because, I believe, because Joseph, he gave his heart to God. I'm not talking about salvation. 
There's one verse that illuminates this idea, verse 9. Here's what he says in verse 9, second part of it, to Potiphar's wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So I've already preached all that. So you know what happened. Potiphar's wife comes in and she wants it. Lie with me. Be with me. That'd be a weird statement just to walk in and say that. We know there's a bigger conversation that happens. But he ends up saying, no, 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 <laughs> can't do that. And why? What's the heart of the matter here? It's this. It has nothing to do with Potiphar. It has nothing to do with her not being attractive. I guarantee you, Pharaoh, his wife, she looked good. King of Egypt, she looked good. Second in command, second richest man, his wife looked good too. Probably 20 years younger than him. So it wasn't about that. It was about how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He says, if, I, if I'm with you, then I hurt everything that God's done here. Joseph says this. He expresses gratitude for what he's been given. He says, your, your husband gave me everything in the house. I've got, I've got total control of it all. That's gratitude. He also expresses a heart of love towards God. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I don't want to hurt my God. He acknowledges right and wrong. They're, this is not right. I can't do this. And he reveals a heart that was close enough to God that when that temptation came, it didn't overtake him. Because at that moment, he's walking with God. And in all of that, we see that God had the heart of Joseph. We saw it in chapter 37. We see it again now in chapter 39. And the entire account of Joseph really is connected to that single statement that he made in Pot to Potiphar's wife. And the way that he honored his father in chapter 37. The way he loved his brothers but wanted to please God and his father more. The way that God revealed to him dreams of his future. The way that Potiphar was pleased with him and at peace with him and eventually fully entrusted him. All of that was wrapped up around his character which was a product of his heart towards God. So, a lot of times, there's a, a passage that we'll hear uh, preached, and it, or we'll hear referenced, and it's a, it's a good passage, and it's got a good purpose, but I want, there's something I want to focus on here. It says, every man, this is, we hear it a lot of times when we're talking about uh, giving, it's a, a passage that uh, a lot of times churches will use when we talk about tithing and things like that. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. But in reality, when you think about that verse, it speaks about the heart of man. It's not about dollars and cents. It's not about things that you do. It's about the heart of man. Every man according as he purpose, purposeth in his heart. It goes on here. It's not that God loves a person more or less based on their money that they give. You can't buy God's love. You can't come to youth group more and more and more and more and God loves you more because of that. If you come one time and you come ten times, you don't get tenfold God's love. That's not what it's based on. That would be a works-based love and that's not what it's based on. What, it is, what that's talking about, when it says, for God loveth a cheerful giver, it's not talking about the person. It's not talking about God loves a person who gives more and more and, and all that. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the heart of that person. Cheerful giving would come from the character of that person, and their character would come from a heart bent towards God. And that's why it says... Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Listen, when you come to youth group, when you come to church, when you do something that you want to do that's religious in nature, you, tell, you invite somebody to church, don't do those things to get favor from God. That's not what it's based on. But your heart should be saying, I love God so much that I want to do these things. That's what that's about. When your parents buy you something, hopefully the reason they're buying it for you it's not out of necessity, not because they're going, oh, man, I wish we wouldn't have had kids because they're expensive, especially Brody, you know, just joking. They, no, hopefully it's not that at all. Really, it's, it, and I know from my parents, and I know from me being a parent, I know from my wife being a parent, and I know from Brother Eddie and many others, the pastor and his wife, observing parents, when your parents love you, they want to give and give and give. And there's times to say no and there's times of everything else. But it doesn't mean their heart's not to give you something. Whenever it goes, Daddy, think we can get some ice cream? I'm going, yeah. Or I'm going, 
maybe not ice cream, but I'll give you something good. That's the heart. And so when you're going, God, I love you so much. I just want to give you that. That's the cheerful giver. That's, and that doesn't just apply to money. It applies to time. God, I'm going to come to the trunk or treat, and I'm going to be a part of that. Yeah, I, there's other things I could do, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to be there because, God, I, I appreciate what you've done in my life. God, I'm so sorry for some of the sins and the things I've done, but you've saved me, and you've changed me, and you've given me a new life, and I'm just so thankful for it. And I just, I just want to be a blessing. That's what we're talking about here. And so the entire account in all of this of Joseph really is connected to that single statement that he made to, to Potiphar's wife and, and about his love and his heart for God and his character that was based on that love for God. Why was David so highly favored? King David. Besides the goodness of God, it may have been the fact that David was a man after God's own heart. And though it isn't stated in the Bible, I think we can conclude Joseph was too. Listen, last week I preached to you guys on, on Joseph's character. I'm sorry that we're in here tonight. I thought this would be a, a lot of fun being in here, but you guys looked like you were able to listen a little better, maybe in the youth room, I don't know. A little different setting, I know. But here's the thing. that We preached about character, and, and I know some of you took it in, and you made some changes in your life, not based on, hopefully not based on the fact that I said it or preached it, or, or you just think that that's something that I would want you to do. Not at all. It's if you're convinced. The Bible says, let every man be convinced in his own heart. And so... Uh, persuaded in his own heart. So if God speaks to your heart and says, no, there is something that I want you to change. There is something I want you to add to your life. Then that's when you do it. And when you do that, it's because your heart's going, God, I just want to be closer to you. I want that. I want to know you. So here's one final application. Here's the big question. Can you train your heart? Like, can you change it? I mean, if you're not feeling this feeling of like, well, my heart's towards God. I don't feel that. First of all, time out. That's a dangerous way to live. I don't feel like doing something. I don't feel like getting out of bed at 5 a.m. But no get up, no worky, no money. So I get up and I do it, even if I don't feel like doing it. As you guys get older, you're going to find out there's times you don't feel like you love your parents. Be careful with that. These morons that are shooting schools, they felt like shooting schools up at that moment. That It leads a, down a dark path. When you get to the extremes of things, when you base your life on how you feel rather than on what is reality... That's a dangerous path to go. You know why people break up? You know why people get divorced? Because they don't feel in love anymore. But that's, they have this wrong idea. Love is not infatuation. Love is not attraction. It's not a feeling. There are emotions that tie into it, but it is an action. It's a choice. Why is it that people can say 20, 30, 40 years into their marriage, I love her more, I love him more today than I did the day we got married? It's because love is not a feeling. It's something that grows in time. It's something that, uh, that matures and it develops. And, that, and why am I even talking about all those? Because ultimately the question was, can you train your heart to love God? Can you change your heart to love him more? You might not feel something right now, but absolutely you can. When you got saved, you were given a new heart. It's not the heart that you were born with. It's, a, it's another heart put in you by the Holy Spirit. It's a heart which has new tastes, new joys, new sorrows, new desires, new hopes, new fears, new likes, new dislikes. It really is. Some of it you can't explain. Things that I loved to watch, movies I loved to watch, I would watch 17, 18, 19, 20 times before I got saved. If I tried to turn them on today, even right after I got saved, they were very distasteful all of a sudden. Because there was so much stuff in them that was like, I laughed at that. Even shows. Shows I watched as a child. And you didn't pick up on a lot of things. And now as an adult, I pick up on a lot of things. And a lot of times they're more distasteful because of that new heart there. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we find that the heart changes like this. There's a battle that goes on. So from a human standpoint, love is something that has to be cultivated. It, it's, it's recognizing that more time with the object that you love, a lot of times it develops it a lot more. I, uh, I'm going to use you guys as an example. I can spend five minutes around you guys, and when I first see you, I'm lit up, but five or 10, 15 minutes with you guys, and I'm much more connected with you already. Does that make sense? If I, if I were to hang out with you guys, I wish that we had a way to do that a lot more. But if I could hang out with you guys, for, and that goes for everybody. I'm just picking on these three guys right here right now. 
but if I, if I could hang out with you guys for an hour and we just went out and just did whatever, you know, went to a shooting range, went to the gym, went and played some street hockey, rollerblading, anything. I can't play lacrosse, but it'd be cool. Um, I'd play, but I'm no good. But if I just hung out with you guys, we just went and got pizza and talked. The, the affection, not the, uh, not the emotion, but the affection, the desire to be with you grows as a result. The more you get to know, now some people, the more you get to know you, drives you away, right? But some people, the more you get to know them, you're more connected. There's nobody else in the world that can finish my sentences like Grace can. It's because we spend time together. I finish hers all the time. I'll say something as at the same time she says the exact same thing. Exact same thing. Over and over and over. We're the, practically the same person. She's got long hair, I got short hair. That's the only difference. Well, that's not the only difference. <laughs> but my point is, same thing's true with God. And you guys, you can have that. So last week we learned, we're done with this. I challenged you with Joseph's character. But you can't have Joseph's character which really should, it would be Nate's character, Brody's character, Anderson's character, Destiny's character. It would be all of your character. But you can't have that if you don't have that same heart. And you can't have a heart towards God without being saved. So that's the progression so far. Salvation happens. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You recognize I'm a sinner and I'm wrong. And I've hurt God and I've done things that are wrong and I've had bad thoughts and I've had bad attitudes. And I recognize now that I'm not perfect. I'm not righteous. That's the right place to be. That puts your heart in the right position. And then you turn to him. That's repentance. And you turn to him in repentance because of faith. You believe that it's real and true. You heard it while I was preaching and something inside says, I believe this. That's faith and repentance. Call on Jesus to save you. It's not that prayer. It's what already happened. It's that turning to him for salvation. And boom, new heart instantly. And then it's, I'm so thankful that he saved me. And things begin to change, and your heart's towards God, and then your character changes over time, and you become more faithful, and you become more trustworthy, and you become cleaner in your living. And here's what happens. A 15-year-old friend may not like that too much. I had friends walk away from me. They go, man, ever since you started going to church, and they didn't know how to, to put it. It was after I got saved. But I tried to see them get saved, and they never did take. And within a couple years, not even six months probably, they were like, you're a different person. And I wasn't fun to hang out with anymore, and then they were gone. But I've got, I could tell you all these other friends that thought I was really cool and had a lot of fun with and enjoyed, and I live a great life. But the point is that in all of that, the character begins to change. And it will change in the rest of your life, too. When you go to school, when you're at home, when you guys get jobs, when you get married, all those things are impacted. But most importantly you have that relationship with God who loves you that much. And it's good. Character of Joseph last week and the heart of Joseph this week. So that's the challenge. So what do we do about that? We're done with this. Here's what we do. Start with the simple. You're here tonight. That's great. Go home and think about what you heard. Come back again. Check it out in your own Bible. Just keep doing that. All right. Well, I'm going to have my dad come and pray, and uh, I know that I, I went longer than I wanted to, but um, what we'll do is I'm not going to read all of these requests. I'm going to let him pray as he feels led of the Lord to pray over these things, and um, I am going to just, rem just say for everybody's sake that we want to remember Pastor Mays, and we want to remember obviously Mrs. Mays and their family, and then Miss Allie, who's in Florida still. And uh, the people that we've mentioned who have cancer or cancer tests going on right now, Kudge and also Evelyn, Seibert, um, and I think that's pretty much it. And then so, uh, and real quick, are, do any of you guys have a prayer request, something we can pray for you about? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Pray for Miranda's aunt's family, or Miranda's family. Okay, and then can I pr can we pray for you, Brody? He's got Crohn's disease, and uh, that affects things that he can eat and different things. So I just would like to pray for Brody that, that God would just have a lot of grace on him. Yes, Brian?
uh, if I repeat what you just said, it'll be on YouTube. Do you are you okay with that? You guess. Uh, we'll just leave it more generic. His family's having some problems with bills, paying bills, and uh, they're missing some utilities right now. So pray for their family. Okay. Anyone else? Do I see another hand? Michaela, did you have your hand? Destiny? No? Okay. All right. Oh, Brian. Yeah, I think we uh, we announced all that before uh, church, so I think we're fine. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. He will or won't be staying? Okay. All right. That's good. All right. So I'm just going to ask remind the teens, because we don't normally do this on Wednesday nights to this level, just be respectful. I know you will while he's praying, and then when he's done, you're dismissed, okay? Let's go to the Lord. Dear God, we, have, we need your ear tonight, Lord. We're just a needy people and many prayer requests. And heavy on our heart and foremost in our mind is our pastor's health. Lord, he's uh, taken from us today and taken to the hospital. And, uh, apparently uh, injuries, and we don't even know uh, what the extent of um, the situation may be at this point. Lord, I just pray for him. Uh, I, I pray that... Uh, this deal with the with the memory issues and so forth is just a temporary thing, and perhaps a virus or something like that, something that's uh, not going to be a, a permanent problem. And I pray, Lord, that you just cure that, and and uh, that whatever the issue was that caused uh, perhaps a dizziness or or a, a feeling of uh, vertigo, or we, we're we're shooting from the hip here, Lord. We don't really know. And, I know you know everything. You're the great healer and physician of all of us. I just beseech you, Lord, to to uh, take care of our pastor. Uh, the, his family's uh, uh, is in a quandary. They're hurting. There, there's confusion, Lord. There's a, a lack of understanding sometimes. We just we know your will because we have your word. Sometimes we don't understand your will, Lord, and, and uh, our our feelings and emotions get in the in the way between our relationship, and I apologize, Lord, when those things happen. We just pray we have faith in you that you will make everything right. We love our pastor. And we need our pastor, Lord. And we just need him back here in, in good health. And I just pray that he'll get rest and, and uh, that his wife will also uh, find ease of mind and peace and rest and, and his daughters and his son and uh, grandchildren, everybody in the family. Lord, I, we have some special requests this evening uh, for prayer. I just uh, I pray for Miranda's family, just there's bereavement there, Lord. And, and uh, without going into details uh, too much uh, over the airwaves and so forth, I just ask you to be with them and in comfort and that uh, somewhere some good would come from that, that uh, perhaps someone becomes closer to you, Lord, and builds their relationship with God as a result of of the loss of a life and a loss of a loved one that uh, there, there can always be good to every situation Lord I pray that uh, that there was a, a godly pe person there in a relationship I pray for uh, the, the, the young man I'm not going to say his name or family name uh, but that uh, asks for your help Lord with uh, financial issues and billing issues and, and uh, maybe getting the power turned back on Lord and uh, perhaps we could be helpful there, Lord, to just uh, bail them out of this uh, time of need. And uh, I just pray, Lord, for uh, for Brody with this Crohn's disease. Uh, this is a debilitating situation. And it, it can be treated, and it does uh, benefit from treatment. I, Lord, I, Lord, I just pray that you just heal him from it and just uh, make it better and, and uh, just uh, t lift that burden from his uh, body and from his spirit and uh, I pray Lord for uh, brother Ben's uh, principal that's uh, has been opened up a dialogue with brother Ben on uh, on you God on faith issues and and uh, I pray that uh, there would be uh, inroads made there and and that uh, it would be an opportunity to uh, uh, evangelize and uh, spread your word into a 
a place where it's difficult to get to and that uh, you might make Brother Ben the, the, uh, the key to that door and just unlock that door and allow him to be able to circulate there. I pray for uh, people on our uh, prayer list, Lord, uh, in the interest of time this evening rather than going through the prayer list name by name and issue by issue. I know, Lord, that you have the power. There's not a single sparrow in that whole bunch of, of uh, people and birds and animals and everything else that you don't know about already. I just pray, Lord, that you'd be there for them and that you'd heal where healing's needed and that you'd comfort where comfort's needing, that you'd strengthen where strength, strengthening is needed, that you would uh, enlighten where confusion is uh, is the rule. And I just I pray, Lord, that you'd just be there for each and every one of the people that we pray for regularly. Uh, and Lord, I, I pray that uh, th those that, uh, that I personally pray for on a weekly basis, uh, uh, so, some of those are really great need. I just continue to pray for them and uh, just ask for your blessings there, Lord. And some other things uh, uh, in, in particular uh, uh, that I really w are heavy on my heart and, and on the heart of many people in the church. We, we just this week, this past week, we found out about our beloved Evelyn Cyber. With um, she's uh, facing some issues with cancer and uh, potentially uh, uh, bladder cancer, and uh, we don't know uh, what stage it is. We think it's early. I, I pray, Lord, that you just conduct a complete healing there. That you just give us a miraculous cure, and that uh, we just be talking about that cure for. Uh, many many years to come and you give Evelyn many more years with us and I just I pray for her health and I pray for Frank's health as well her husband uh, is 92 and and uh, he has some issues with his heart and so forth and just uh, give them both strength and and uh, uh, thank you Lord that uh, they're still together and can rely on each other as well and Lord uh, I pray for um, uh, Brian Mays and uh, some of his health issues and uh, he's going through the the uh, issue with his father and yet he's here in your house this evening Lord and he comes in uh, with uh, interest in his heart to uh, to be better at uh, uh, evangelization and uh, just your, his complete walk with you Lord I, I pray for your for your hand upon him I pray for your hand on each of these young folks here that that have come this evening and I pray that the, that they would just have a, a great need for you, Lord, in their in their heart and in their belly. I just pray that uh, what they hear here in this in this location would just um, encourage them to come back for more. I pray for their salvation eventually, and I just pray, Lord, that uh, that others would be so moved that they would come this way as well. That uh, if they lose a friend here or they lose a friend there, that you make many new friends for them in uh, their newfound fellowship with you, Lord. I just pray for Brother Ben and his family. I pray for, uh, again, uh, when, as I close here, I, I pray most especially for Mrs. Mays. As, uh, uh, she's, uh, I understand she's uh, uh, really in a, in a hard way with uh, what's going on with her husband. And I just pray, Lord, that you just give her strength and comfort. And Thank you for your opportunity to be in your house and to come and fellowship in your name. Thank you for the way that you care for us, the way that you protect us. And I just ask you to be with us as we go out among this safe house, out into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.